Hi, I'm Matt Needham, and this is my lecture from Chapter 10 of the Uniform Mechanical Code on boilers and pressure vessels. Now, at the beginning of the chapter, it doesn't give you a great definition of what a boiler is, so let's review for just a moment what the definition was from Chapter 2 of the Uniform uh, Mechanical Code. Here it says, a boiler is a closed vessel used for heating water or liquid or for generating steam or uh, vapor by direct application of heat from combustible fuels or electricity. Now, um, I don't like that definition very much, and I'd change it if I could, but I can't because I don't like the fact that a boiler doesn't mean that something, you know, it doesn't mean that something's boiling. It, 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 basically, they can be glorified hot water heaters where you're heating high pressure um, water or very high temperature water, but it's not actually boiling. But uh, when we provide hydronic heating, whether it's steam or hot water, they consider them to be boilers. And let's get the definition here, the difference between um, high pressure and low pressure boilers. So uh, under high pressure boilers, is a, a boiler furnishing steam at a gauge pressure in excess of 15 pounds per square inch. Um, so if you have above 15 pounds pressure of steam pressure, then you have a high pressure boiler. And generally that's like where you need to have a uh, steam engineer, boiler operator um, to tend the boiler uh, for safety because these high pressure boilers tend to be um, more dangerous. And then also along with that, it's considered a high pressure boiler for not steam, but for water. If you heat the water in excess to 250 degrees or in excess of 160 PSI pressure on the water. So very high pressure water or very high temperature water or steam over 15 PSI is um, a high pressure boiler. Now, uh, they're not as common as low pressure boilers where we're either heating steam up to 15 um, PSI or we're um, just heating water below that 250 or the 160. So, um, we have some, um, we have a picture here I want to show you to begin with of a very simple boiler where you have like a, a water tube boiler and um, uh, you have a fire here and uh, maybe you can see that. There it is. And it's simple as a fire heating water going up to provide steam. And then even here on the left, uh, you could shovel in coal or whatever and the water would go up. And, and I actually had an old boss who lived in a really old home, which was probably built in the late 1800s. And it was an old beat down home. And as a teenager, he would have to get up every morning and light the boiler and go, and this is back east in Pennsylvania, and shovel the coal into the boiler. This boiler worked with no electricity. The heating system had no electricity. It was, and, and when you kind of understand how simple this boiler was, it kind of helps you build upon the more complexities of the modern day boiler. And so he would shovel coal and get the fire going at 4 or 5 a.m. and then maybe crawl back into bed for an hour or something. And the boiler would heat that water and then the water would turn to steam. And then simply the steam would go up into the house and find its way through these radiator coils that were just sitting in the room. And as it would go through the radiator coils, it would give off its heat and heat each room had a radiator coil. And then it would condense back and fall back into the boiler to be heated again. And uh, there were no fans or um, uh, no gas valves or anything like that. It was just him shoveling coal and heating water until it boiled and made its way up and back through. And that was pretty much it. So those were some of the early boilers that people had in their homes in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, now we have, you know, modern technology with uh, serious safety controls and more efficiency. And when you are doing water, when you're heating water, hydronics, not the steam, but typically when you're heating water, low pressure boiler for a facility, it can be a massive facility. And I used to have uh, run these high pressure boilers, boiler operator, 
and then they converted to these glorified hot water heaters essentially and we were making which is common 190 degree water and pumping it all over this facility the school and then we would run that through hot water coils and blow air over it and it was all controlled with energy management and everything but hydronics the art of heating and cooling with with water um, so that would be an example of uh, like a low pressure type boiler system um, here where you don't need to have a, a boiler operator right there with it and then these boilers um, they're um, either they usually get fi uh, fired on the west coast with natural gas but they could um, be using fuel oil which there's plenty of on the the east coast um, electric heat um, not so much coal anymore but it may still be out there um, I know there's a couple good pizza places in New Haven Connecticut that cook their pizzas directly in an oven with coal but okay that's another story now um, so in the actual chapter 10 of boilers and uh, pressure vessels which I'll be referencing here um, it talks about that this chapter is basically for anything that isn't a hot water heater. It says, um, so hot water heaters, which would be up to 120 gallons and not exceeding a 200,000 BTU input, are not part of this. But we're talking about for heating, um, buildings, uh, bigger equipment, this kind of thing. Okay? Um, now, also let's go over a little bit of basic terms. Although I'm going over the code, I want you to kind of have an understanding of some of these things because it's if you just read the chapter, you're you're kind of lost. Okay, so um, we have con, uh, conventional boilers where the flue gases, or when you burn that natural gas and you mix it with air, um, the flue gases that come out that vent or chimney pipe that takes out once you burn it and get that nice blue flame and you heat um, you heat up the water then the flue gas is coming up that chimney pipe. If they're 130 degrees or above, you know, that's t a typical normal um, conventional boiler where it may be whatever, 82, 83, 84% efficient, meaning that if you put in a million BTUs, you'll get 820,000 BTUs out of it. 800, a million BTUs for a giant boiler um, of pure natural gas energy every hour, you would get 80, 820,000, we'll say 82% boiler efficiency. But then you lose a lot of BTUs up your, up your flue pipe or up your chimney, right? And that pipe is usually really hot. And then a condensing furnace would be where the flue gases are below 130 degrees, where you're actually making use of all of the heat that you paid for, not all of it, but maybe 95% efficient, 93% efficient. Um, so 930,000 BTUs of the million going into your, your water or steam. And then because you have an extra heat exchanger in there, and one of the main byproducts of combustion is water vapor and you get that latent heat out and you condense the water vapor and you also have to have a separate, just like you will for a condensing furnace, you need for a boiler, a condensate line that takes that um, condensate away because you'll, you'll be getting actual water out of this thing. It's kind of amazing, like, hey, this thing produces water and um, the water's somewhat acidic and we get rid of that and then we're able to get up to a higher efficiency. And I think we're really going this way in California, I mentioned again, in the last year, um, we have to we can only install new furnaces, condensing furnaces. We're not allowed to uh, install these lower efficiency, 80% um, furnaces anymore. Um, I'm not sure. I looked up right before the lecture. I could I found that information about the 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 furnaces um, online, but I wasn't able to see if there was a new law about the boilers that could be coming. I'm not sure. Now. Um, so you have your conventional and your high efficiency or condensing furnaces, okay? And then you also have made like two historically main types of boilers. That first one I showed you in the picture on the phone, 
um, is a water tube boiler. And water tube boilers means that you have water going through tubes that are heated up. Um, and then you have fire tube boilers where you actually have fire going down the throat of these tubes and the um, products of combustion are in the last few loops of, of those fire tubes and then it goes out the flue pipe and then surrounding all of your tubes is water. And then those tubes give up their heat to the water and then it can make steam um, or it can just heat the water um, up to a high temperature and pressure uh, if you have that kind of boiler. Uh, okay, and let's get on to here um, an expansion tank. An expansion tank is when you have water and you heat water, it expands, okay? And when you have a sealed system, you have to have somewhere for that water to go. So you have an expansion tank. The old ones were like giant vessels where you'd have air on top of half of it and water on the bottom half and you'd have a sight glass on the side and you'd maintain an air cushion there. Um, a lot of the other ones though, not wanting to get air and corrosion and, and the oxygen into the piping and all of that, we have these ones with like a bladder system where when the water heats up, the bladder expands and compresses air or nitrogen that might be set at uh, you know, a pressure of for 12 to 15 PSI or depends on the pressure in the system and gives it room to expand and contract there. And I'll try and show you a picture of that in a minute. And then also we have pumps that circulate the water around. Because um, obviously you're trying to usually get hot water or something to a coil and have it go through a coil. You heat water, it goes through a coil, and then you blow a fan over that. And I used to work on these high pressure boilers where we would make steam. It would go all over the school that I worked at. And then at each building they had a steam station where the steam would heat the water for that building and then the water would be pumped around to about 20 coils in each building and there were like 18 major buildings. Okay, and in the pump we have an impeller and a volute and I'm gonna try and show you a picture of that in a minute. And then also we use this term, like we're, we're pretty familiar most of us with the term of a thermostat controlling air temperature. Well. When it comes to water, we call it an aquastat, right? So only Aquaman can, no, an aquastat. And we have two types. We have a control that controls the temperature of the water. When the water gets hot enough, the aquastat opens up, shuts the boiler off. Um, when the water cools off too much, the aquastat closes and brings on the boiler. And then we also have to have like a safety limit switch where if you have problems and the water gets too hot, there's a separate thermostat that shuts everything off. So two types of aquastat, your standard control and your limit switch. Okay, let me see if I can show you a few pictures before we hit the uh, chapter. Um, just one second here. I'm trying to make a, it's frustrating, I'm trying to make this video with uh, my phone and my wife's phone. And um, uh, I'm making the video with my phone and I'm not as familiar with her um, her phone, I had the pictures, here we go. Okay, so here's a picture of the expansion tank with like a bladder type system and the water goes there and then it can bow down and in here you have that. And you'll see at the bottom a little nib. That's just like, uh, you could almost like even literally on some of these put a bicycle pump and pump the proper air pressure into it, okay? And then um, we also have um, the um, pump that I was showing you. And uh, here's a pump. Now, a lot of the bigger pumps actually are a separate motor with a shaft that um, drives the pump. But here's a normal uh, circulating pump that you might run into. And that little lump on top is uh, probably a start capacitor. Um, there. Okay, so there's a pump and also um, we have on the pump we have uh, inside the pump we have an impeller and that's what uh, I've written on the board there, an impeller. Um, there's a shadow. 
An impeller is the part that spins around and pushes the water around. It's like the wheel for the water. It's like the water wheel. And then it spins in t inside of a housing. And the name of that housing is the volute. Okay? And um, also, here's kind of a look of a modern um, uh, boiler system. We can't see all the things very easily, but here's where your... Um, the air comes out like your vent where your products of combustion come out the top. You have a pressure relief valve over here and for safety, if everything goes wrong, it'll blow off water or steam instead of causing an explosion. Your gas valve is down here. Um, and then you have a couple of operating controls right there. And then here's your sight glass on the side to check your water level on the boiler. Okay. All right. So that's kind of a little introduction to some of the names and parts, some visuals, and we went over some definitions. Now let's hit uh, a little bit of information in the actual chapter 10 um, so that you can understand it a little bit better. Uh, now, you have to have drainage for um, uh, boilers uh, where you can drain water off of the boiler, whether it's to drain down or even if you're operating a boiler, you can blow down a boiler. Um, blow down a like Popeye, you know, blow me down, you know, because he worked on a ship with a boiler. And so we open this, there's a, usually a handle on these big valves I used to open up and blow the heavy mineral deposits and sediment off the bottom of the boiler, okay? Um, all right, so we call that um, a blowdown. Some people call it a bleed off. I, I prefer the term bleed off for water treatment for cooling towers and evaporative condens condensers, and then a blowdown for boilers. Okay, uh, now these you can't have it just directly going into city piping if you have really high hot water pressure steam um, because you can damage the piping. There usually has to be some kind of neutralizing channel where it cools down enough. Um, where you're not going to be damaging city um, drain piping, okay? Um, and then you have to have boilers mounted, and they, there's different thicknesses that are required on cement pads, and boilers are extremely heavy, and we're going to get involved in the weight of the boiler and show you that it's not just the weight of the boiler, it's, um, it's, uh, it's the weight of the water, really. Um, that adds so much to it. And boilers are some of the biggest of mechanical, of things in the air conditioning refrigeration trade. The biggest things that exist are cooling towers. Um, you could have massive cooling towers for nuclear power plants, 20,000 ton. But I've seen some boilers that are gigantic, that are, you know, up off the base of the ground or 14 feet high and 36 uh, feet long and... Um, 15 feet wide. There's some big, big boilers out there. Okay. Um, so it has to be mounted properly. And then it even tells you it's kind of comical in the commentary here. It says never install a boiler on combustible flooring or carpeting. So no boilers on your carpet, please. Now, okay. Uh, And then obviously, um, things have to be protected from excessive pressures. Um, usually boilers are in mechanical rooms, well-mounted, um, sealed off from other areas. Only authorized personnel should be allowed to get near a boiler. Um, and especially high pressure boilers. Boilers need to have certain things. Um, certain safeties. We have to have a safety means of assuring the fuel supply. Do you have enough natural gas pressure? There should be safety for that. Um, do you have air supply? Um, not talking about the band from the 70s. I'm talking about do you have enough air? Combustion air. That's what we're really talking about is because you're mixing the air with the fuel, let's say natural gas, and you have to have a consistent flow of that from the outside uh, plenty of air for that and unrestricted and that's where we usually have like a combustion blower or something that verifies that we're we're getting proper pre-purge we're getting um, the products of combustion um, out and that we're having air come in there now um, low fire startup control 
generally that means that you need to be able to start a boiler on low fire you know one of the things that ruins things is expansion and contraction turning on a boiler for the first time um, if you do that a lot of times if it's been sitting off uh, and the water temperature inside the boiler is cold you'll hear, hear a lot of creaking and popping uh, on the piping and in the boiler because the metal is expanding for the first time. There's some boilers that they just never shut off. They just run them 24 seven so that the boiler isn't exposed to these drastic temperature changes, right? And if you ever go to start, start up a boiler that's been off for any period of time, start it in that low fire mode. I used to always start my boilers low fire manual and just let them warm up for as long as possible. So even if you're working in a situation where you're running a boiler like a high pressure boiler or something, and you're starting it up for the first time, make sure you have plenty of time so that it can run at low fire for as long as you can so that you heat it more slowly, you don't strain the piping um, and the vessel, uh, etc. cetera, okay? Um, you need to have, uh, obviously, temperature control, uh, limit switches with your Aquastat, um, low water cutoff, uh, so you need to have a lot of different safety things in order to ensure the safety of a modern boiler, um, not just a guy shoveling too much coal into a, a furnace anymore, okay? Um, and if you saw the Titanic, that was actually uh, the movie. Um, they show the guys, like, we want to set a record to go from uh, whatever was part of England to New York in record time because we have this amazing, unsinkable ship and they what how did they make the ship go faster they said all right shovel coal faster and they just jammed in tons of coal until they hit an iceberg and everyone died happy story happy times okay now um the water level when you have a sight class which it shows you three pictures of a sight class in the illustrated training manual there you probably can't see that too well but there's no such thing as where the water levels is perfectly stable. It moves up and down a little bit. On average, you want it to be right in the middle of the side class, but it can go up and down um, uh, as, as more steam is released um, um, off the top of the boiler. Uh, it's going to change as the fire um, heats up. The boiler is going to change, all right? Uh, now, welding done on a boiler has to be done by a certified welder because of safety. So a lot of times when you have fire tube boilers, periodically they need to be tested for, I think it's like an eddy current, with, to make sure to see, do you have any weak spots or are there any tubes that are compromised? And then you'll have a certified, now again, you have to make repairs like this because some of these boilers are massive. And the idea of replacing the boiler, I mean, it's like, you you know, you have to have a roll-up door or take out a giant wall and get permits and cranes and, and block the freeway to get another one delivered or extra wide load. It's a whole lot that goes on to it. So there's companies that retube boilers and will have a certified welder take out the old fire tubes, uh, some of them, and then weld in new ones. And they have to be a certified welder to make sure that the welds are, you know, near perfect. All right? Um... And then again, we have to have expansion tanks on the um, on the boiler systems, okay? Uh, because when you water can expand when you heat it and create almost five percent more volume than before cold water, it has to have a place to expand to, okay? Um, and then it just talks about like expansion tanks or tank capacity to give you a sense, and this is kind of true of the boilers also, but just a water storage tank or a uh, expansion tank or any kind of, even a hot water heater, you can think of this, it, the principles apply. And what the code regulates is, is if you had like a 40 gallon hot water heater, which most of you have in your homes, um, the for an expansion tank, it's 95 pounds. Now, some of these residential ones, I don't know, I just installed one actually. I don't know what it weighed. It might have weighed about 90 pounds or 80, 85 pounds, maybe 95 pounds, I don't know. And But when you fill it up, the water weight of a 40 gallon, not the tank, just the water, is 333 pounds, okay? 333 pounds. So if you add the 95 
plus the 333, you get 428. And they're saying that the pad you put it on or the cement has to be able to always handle double the actual weight you're going to have. You have to over-engineer it so it can really handle more. So it has to be able to support 856 pounds. If you go up to water, a tank of water holding 100 gallons of water, okay, that means the weight of the tank might be 185 pounds. The water weight is 833 for a total of 10, 1,018, meaning you need 2,036 um, pounds, whatever you put it on, right? That's another reason why we don't, we tend not to put like water tanks and things like that on roofs or whatever, because water, oh, it weighs a lot. It weighs a whole lot, okay? All right. Um, let's move on. Um, boilers, hot water heaters have to have pressure, temperature, pressure relief valves, because again, like with a steam boiler, if everything fails, your last resort is the pressure relief valve. Because if something were to happen to your gas valve and the gas valve just stays stuck open and gas keeps flowing to the fire and the fire just stays on even when you don't need the heat or the hot water, then the pressure can build up and up and up and it's possible to have like a steam bomb situation. That's why they always say with high pressure boilers, you need to have physically have somebody come by uh, and be looking at the gauges and monitoring the boiler uh, and make sure it's not hopping a little bit um, boilers that start getting out of control, um, they make some noise. Uh, um, but anyways, um, you have to have a pressure relief valve and that will discharge excess pressure out and blow that steam pressure off um, before you have like a big explosion or something like that, okay? Um, and then again, we have to consider where does that go? We can't just have that go right out into the boiler room uh, in your face or whatever. Even hot water heaters, you'll notice that you'll see a copper pipe coming off the pressure relief valve and it just stubs off and stops a little lower than my hand. Because if a, pre a hot water heater at your house, if the gas valve got stuck open, which is kind of hard to do because they make it where there's two independent things that must open inside your hot water heater um, to prevent this. But if something happened, then it discharges and it blows off that extra water pressure, which could be turning to steam now because you have a dangerous situation. They won't let it stub off here and hit you in the face and blind you and scar your face. Um, and they won't put it right on the ground because it can hit the ground and come back up to your face. They're just, they make sure that they just scald your kneecaps and your ankles and then it goes out like that. So that's what we do for residential, but we usually have to, have something a little more elaborate for um, where it discharges for high pressure boilers, okay, in particular, all right, where it is safe. Now, you can't, you have to have, like they're always trying to think because people will try and defeat things. People don't like water drips. They don't like losing water. So when you have a, 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 a pipe coming off of a pressure relief valve, that can't have threads on it. Because if it has threads on it, somebody's like, hey, I'll just thread on a valve and shut that valve and stop the leak. Now you have no protection. So they don't, don't even let you get near that. They don't even let you do that. Um, all right. Uh, now, um, okay, let's move on. Uh, it says periodically check the valve to make sure it can open and close um, and that it isn't cor corroded closed. Now this is a tricky proposition, and this is why a lot of times I think it's wise for companies to hire in-house people um, to, to take care of their maintenance and repairs. Because when you hire outside companies, what happens is when people do maintenance, they cut corners to save time. And when you have a pressure relief valve, there's a little poppet valve on top, you're supposed to exercise that and make sure that it opens and can get flow water out clearly and that it isn't jammed shut, rusted shut and have minerals stuck on that seat where it will not open. However, when guys do maintenance from the outside, what oftentimes can happen if they lift up that poppet valve, water might leak out of it, but then granules of salt that were right there get in there and block it from resealing. And now you have a drip and they're like, hey, 
you just did maintenance on this. We didn't do, we didn't have a leak before. Now you caused a leak. So people are aware of that and they're like, ah, I just won't even check it this time. Let's just go to lunch. Um, so that's a safety issue. Um, you know, just taking the back end of a, I have one here. Just taking like the back end of a screwdriver, if you have anything, a valve of any kind that won't reset, a lot of times if you open and close that valve, I mean, I've done this on toilets, on everything, and then you just kind of, just like the people are like, what are you doing? I know, just peacefully working. See, this isn't stressful work. Then I hit the valve and I open and close it. And then those little minerals that are stuck on the seat of the valve, whatever kind of valve it is, they may break loose and clear out and then the valve will reseat. So sometimes just not, not hard, don't hit it hard, but vibration is your friend for loosening anything. You have like pipes that seem like they will not come apart, a big pipe you're working on, and you just, and there's a rubber on the end here, so it's not, and on top, and you just do that, and sometimes that can get you out of a pinch. That's a little service tip um, for you uh, right there. So um, that's something to consider in maintenance is that we're supposed to be able to blow that off and how many people actually do that for their hot water heaters at home, you know, probably not a bad idea. Okay. Um, and then you also, of course, have to have a manual shut off for the natural gas. Let's say you're using natural gas where you can just shut it off because if you came into a situation where you came up on a boiler or even a hot water heater or anything like that and somehow the gas valve was just stuck open. The next thing you should do is to go shut the natural gas off and then get away from it and let everything cool off or whatever. So that, I mean, I wouldn't mess with the pop it valve or the pressure relief valve or anything because you're looking to really get hurt yourself. Um, you want to shut that fuel supply off um, right away. And so you have to make sure we have a manual a valve that we can close, okay? All right. Um, and again, you have to have a low water cutoff as one of your safeties on a boiler. You don't want to let the water get too low. The boiler can melt down, overheat. Um, uh, a lot of boilers, you know, it's very critical to have that sight glass so you can see where the water level is. And then there's a float valve inside where if the water level gets too low, it, it the float valve falls down and shuts off the boiler, okay? Or there'll be some kind of conductivity probe based on the conductivity of the water that would do the same thing. But there has to be some uh, low water cutoff, okay? Okay. Um, and that should be cleaned um, on a regular basis and checked. And a lot of times when you get your boiler, high pressure boiler per se, inspected, by an insurance company or something like that, or an inspector, they'll want everything opened up and see that it's all clean in there. Um, and I used to work on some boilers that were so old they didn't make the gaskets for the floats that went in there. And they'd have floats in there and then a little electrical switch on top. So I would actually take a circle cutter, a ball peen hammer, and make with gasket material my own gaskets um, on the flanges. Okay. Now, um, and here's a picture of a low water um, cutoff um, right there. Uh, is a very typical one. The float you can see is in there, and the electric switch would be underneath that um, cap. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, when you're sensing water temperature, it needs to be at the top of the tank or vessel. We have something called stratification, um, which actually creates all the weather on the planet because in the oceans, the cold water falls down, the warm water rises up, and it creates the ocean currents, which creates the weather. Likewise, we know that heat does not rise. We know that warm air is lighter than cold air, and warm air tends to rise up. Warm water is lighter than cold water. So, I mean, even if you heat your hot water heater up to 130 degrees and then you just shut it off, you just manually shut the gas off and you leave it there for an hour and you come back, well, the top of the hot water heater might be 
whatever, 127, if you were to actually get a probe at the very top, and it might be like 123 at the bottom, because you have this stratification, it's a long, tall cylinder, and the water temperature on top. So if you're protecting against over temperature, you need to be taking the water from the hottest area, which here it says the top six inches, okay? All right, um, and then uh, if you have manholes on top of um, the boiler, that can be removed, um, you have to have three feet of clearance. Now, I've, st I've straddled big boilers like this and had to take those off, and in a cramped area, it's tough, okay? Now, if you don't have a manhole on top of the boiler, just so you have airspace around it so people can rig it and do different things, you need to have two feet above the top of the boiler, okay? Um, and that concludes my lecture on boilers and pressure vessels. Thank you.